Okay, I'm going to, um, I'll pray for Matt and then I'm going to hand over to him. Father, thank you so much um, for Matt. Lord, on a busy morning where, where he's doing loads of stuff, it's tricky to find a bit of time um, to kind of chill before you speak. And so we pray, Lord, that you would be really close to him. Thank you for what he's prepared. Thank you for the time he's taken. And um, we just pray that you'd um, help him to know that he is speaking the words that you want to bring to us. We pray for us, Lord. We pray that we'd be receptive to the things that we need to hear. And uh, we just ask that you'd really bless him for all that he's put into this morning. Thank you. Amen. How are we doing? Look at that. A wonderful murmur. Good to share with you today. Uh, I've met you before. My name is Matt. And we're starting a new series this morning uh, called Sharing the Hope of Jesus. If you've been around for a while, you know that our vision for this season is to be a community that shares the hope and the love of Jesus amongst ourselves, but also with the community around us. By love, we mean uh, the compassion, the grace, the mercy, the generosity of Jesus. And by hope, we mean the truth that he is the way, the truth and the life. He is the one that we can follow, the one that we can trust and the one who will ultimately lead us to eternal life with our Father in heaven. And I guess if I was going to give a bit of a, a, a quick audit of Christ the Rock, which I'm sure what you'd love me to do, uh, I think probably on the love side, we're doing pretty good. I don't know about you, but I, I could probably think of several things. Uh, think of the community cafe, think of food bank, think of our home groups, all kinds of places around church life where the grace, the love, the peace of God is being expressed to each other, but also around this community. I wonder, though, whether there might be a bit of a challenge in terms of how we're doing with sharing the hope of Jesus. I wonder if we were going to ask ourselves seriously about this wider community, Yates, Sobri, beyond, beyond in terms of our places of work and families and so on. Um, how confident would we feel of finding evidence of the hope of Jesus, of people coming to see Jesus as the one they can follow and trust. I wonder whether there might be a bit more of a challenge there. And so over uh, the month of May and a little bit into June, we're going to be looking particularly at what it means to share the hope of Jesus with those around. So I'm going to invite Nick, who's going to come and read to us this morning from a well-known passage uh, from John 1. So Nick. Good morning. This is the first 14 verses from the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all those who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Thanks, Nick. Anyone feeling vaguely Christmassy? It's one of our Christmas readings often. So, uh, you might know, that my wife is Sophie, and Sophie is French. And that means that when she comes home from work and I ask her how her day was, she has two options. She can speak to me in French or she can speak to me in English. Uh, the content of what she might say would be the same in both. She'd be saying the same things. And yet the difference is, if she was to say to me uh, in English, I would I was going to say totally. I'd probably totally understand. 
uh, everything about her day. But if she was to say it to me in French, despite her efforts, despite the very clear instructions of my father-in-law on our wedding day, uh, because I haven't learned French, it would be incomprehensible to me. And the reason I say that is I imagine for most of us in this room, we probably know some pretty good things about Jesus. You've been around church a while, probably heard a few good talks, sung some nice songs, might have done an alpha course or something like that. And so we probably have some good stuff we know about him. And yet, I don't know whether I'm just talking for myself here, but I can imagine for lots of us, when it comes to sharing that with other people, it can almost feel like we're talking a different language. It can feel to me anyway, on some, some level, that what we do here on a Sunday uh, is quite difficult to translate to people maybe who don't know Jesus or know him a little bit in the rest of the week. And I guess a good question for us to start with as we look at this series is how can we share the hope of Jesus in a language people will understand? Not that we necessarily uh, suddenly start speaking French or German, uh, but rather instead that we speak words about Jesus that speak directly into the hearts and minds of people today. Uh, there's a Dutch Catholic priest called Henri Nguyen. Uh, and writing in the late 1990s, he wrote a book called The Wounded Healer. And in it, he outlined three traits that he said characterized the modern mind. He said, we all experience, this is his words, not mine, uh, feelings of dislocation from the world, a fragmentation of belief, and a deep desire for purpose. So what does he mean by that? So dislocation from the world. Newman would say that nowadays people are more aware of the vastness of the world than ever before. And we have a greater understanding of the magnitude of the great world events. And yet at the same time, we have a corresponding sense of our own smallness in comparison. So I think a good example of this might be something like the US election. Coming up later this year, I'm sure probably most of us feel aware of the massiveness of this event, the magnitude of its importance, and yet the truth is all of us can bear very, well, exceptionally little influence on the result. And we could probably think of other examples. We might think of climate change, the war in Gaza, the current cost of living crisis. It is easy to, on the one hand, recognize the vastness of what is going on in the world and yet feel very small in comparison. And Nguyen would say that what this creates is a sense of dislocation. I don't know if you can see this picture. Very, uh, it was uh, a picture of a dislocated shoulder. And on the one hand, the joint is still part of the same body, it's, and so for us, we're still part of the world, and yet there is a sense of painful detachment from it. Secondly, he would say we're experiencing a fragmentation of belief. This is probably an oversimplification, but it has often been said that in past generations, there was a clearer sense of what was right or wrong, good or bad, noble or evil. And nowadays, it would only take a quick glance at this week's newspaper headlines or the council elections to see that we are much more divided and unsure about some of the great issues of the day. Nguyen writes, one of the most visible phenomena of our time is a tremendous exposure man has to divergent and often contrasting ideas religious convictions and lifestyles. Through mass media, he, he's talking about humanity, is confronted with the most paradoxical of human experiences. So he's saying to live today is to live with a sense of, of living in a paradox. Where on the one hand, we might say, look at the power of technology to change the world. Look at the power of technology and what it's given us in terms of able, being able to perform some of the most technical, life-saving surgeries. And yet it is also that same power that created the atom bomb. 
Or you might say, we now have this amazing ability to travel from here on planet Earth to the moon and probably one day beyond, at the same time as feeling unable to prevent endless war and conflict on our own planet. Or indeed, we might say nowadays, uh, lots of people would say there's a real value in being well-traveled, in having experienced life in other cultures. And yet at the same time, lots of those people would also recognize the devastating impact on climate change of global travel. In other words, we live with this sense, Nguyen is saying, of, of feeling like we live in this paradox of not knowing what to believe. And so it leads to fragmentation, both across society. So lots of people would recognize we're perhaps becoming more divided as a society. But no one would say also internally, we are more unsure and anxious over what to believe for ourselves. Um, and what this leads to is, Nguyen would say, a longing for meaning for people who feel dislocated from the world around them, unsure what to believe. This leaves us with the ultimate question, what am I here for? You might think of uh, the posters, Alpha, the Christian course, Introduction to Christianity, and how they advertise it. They don't have questions about suffering or the Bible or forgiveness, but rather about purpose. Is there more to life than this? That's what people are left with. And I think it's important to note, Nguyen isn't just writing about non-Christians. He's saying, even for us, and I would say, I definitely echo a lot of what Nguyen is saying there for myself. And the reason I say this is that in many ways, the audience that John was writing to in the first century would echo much of what Nguyen is articulating. John is the latest of the four Gospels, probably written about 100 um, AD, so about maybe 60 or so years after Jesus died. And he was writing to a people dispersed around the Israel area because of, Jew of Roman persecution. You've got a picture uh, on the top right. You've got the Temple of Jerusalem that was destroyed in about 70 AD. And what this meant is that the people of Israel, the people of the early church, were having to work out what does it mean to live under Roman rule. And what they would have experienced is they would have gone from being, in some sense, a small independent nation to being part of a much greater empire of which they could have comparatively little effect. Similarly, you might say that over many centuries, they tried to keep a tight grasp on their beliefs, their values, traditions. Well, as they lived under Roman rule, this would have started to mix with the broader Roman culture. And indeed, thinking of the Old Testament, they would have been left with this great hope for a Messiah of which the final word was spoken of roughly 400 years before. And so they would have been left with questions, I imagine, like, what are we even doing here? What is our place in the world? And what are we to believe today? And so the question for John is, how do we share the hope of Jesus with people like this? Now, I'm aware that was probably an overlong introduction. So I'll try and be brief, but just three uh, quick ideas. First of all, um, and they're very simple, by the way, uh, John points to Jesus. John doesn't start with a political statement. He doesn't start with a list of kind of New Testament Ten Commandments. He starts by painting this extraordinary picture about the nature of Jesus Christ. He says Jesus was the word of God. You might say a lot about that term in terms of how it would have been understood by the Jews or the Greeks. But I think for me, the best explanation is that our words are the clearest expression of who we are. Whatever 
clothes we might wear, whatever car we might drive, whatever job we may have. It is what we say, in a sense, I think, that reveals the most about us. And so when John says Jesus is the word of God, he's, like, he's saying this is like Jesus is the human form of God expressing himself within humanity. He is God's revelation, his self-expression for us. He speaks of Jesus as being God himself, but also there at the beginning of time. He says, in Jesus, all things were made, and him and in him was life and the light of all mankind. Again, this is John echoing the story of Genesis, saying all you believed about God at the beginning as creator, as the source of light and life, we can believe about Jesus as well. And then in some of the most remarkable words, he says, and to all who believed in Jesus' name, he gave the right to become children of God. It is perhaps a simple point, but for John, speaking to people living in a complex, difficult, probably overwhelming world, he points very simply to the person of Jesus. I remember when I was at Woody's uh, several years ago, hearing Rob Scott Cook uh, speak on evangelism. Uh, you've probably heard Rob chair a couple of times he's been here before. And Rob is one of those really annoying people who just is like a natural evangelist. Um, and I remember him saying something that always stuck with me. That in his experience, Christians often find it easier to speak about church than they do to speak about Jesus. It's easy to talk about church to non-Christians. It's what we do on a Sunday. It might be part of what we do midweek. It might be able to introduce people to th friends through church. We talk about the positive effect of church on the local community. And yet it's good to do that. And obviously I think that's a wonderful thing because you all employ me. Um, but it's worth recognizing that is not the model of the New Testament. The New Testament is a consistent set of people explaining the person of Jesus to others. It's very briefly, in Acts 1, Jesus calls his disciples to be his witnesses in the world. In Acts 2, after Pentecost, Peter, speaking to the crowds, tells them, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus who you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. In Acts 3, Peter has just healed or seen God heal through him, a man born lame from birth. And after this, when he's confronted, he declares, but it was by faith in the name of Jesus that this man who you see and know was made strong. In Acts 4, we read of the Jewish leaders plotting against the early disciples because we read the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. In Acts 5, whilst on trial at the Sanhedrin, Peter declares to them, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging on a cross. Later in that same chapter, day after day in the temple courts, from house to house, the disciples never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. And it continues. One of my favorite verses uh, from Paul, writing in 2 Timothy. Paul puts it like this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel. I wonder for you, if you were maybe going home this afternoon, going into work next week, whatever your next kind of natural encounter would be with someone who doesn't know Jesus for themselves, if they were to ask you, why are you Christian? Would the name of Jesus be in our answer? Secondly, John pointed to testimony. Describing uh, John the Baptist, um, I find it quite annoying that the writer of John's gospel also but it's quite a lot of emphasis on John the Baptist. Got a bit mixed in the two Johns, but there we go. Um, he says, speaking of John the Baptist, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And he came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all may believe. You might have heard me say before that the word witness and testify there, this is my 
uh, English, ex-English teacher with nerdiness. They are the noun and verb forms of the word martis. And it is the word used to describe someone in a court of law giving evidence of what they have seen. And indeed, a few verses later in chapter 1, John The author returns to the figure of John the Baptist in the wake of Jesus' baptism. And John the author writes that John the Baptist gave this testimony concerning Jesus' baptism. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I have seen and testify this is God's chosen one. What is John the Baptist doing here? Very simply, he is giving his own personal testimony testimony about the person of Jesus. I know for me, when it comes to sharing faith, I can feel like I need to have the answer to every possible theological or philosophical question to immediate hand. How can a good God allow suffering? What do you believe about the Bible? How does Christianity relate to other religions? How can you believe in the supernatural? How do you reconcile faith and science? Go. I'm feeling like I have to walk around with this kind of like, this like trigger of apologetics. And as much as obviously there's a lot of value in that, this has to be against the backdrop, I think, of being able to share with people what we ourselves have seen and heard about the person of Jesus. I remember hearing an interview with Nicky Gumbel a couple of years ago. Nicky Gumbel helped start the Alpha course. And he was speaking about the change in the questions people were bringing to Alpha meetings. He said in the beginning, they were the big questions of things like suffering or the nature of God, or the reality of the universe, or how do we understand heaven and hell? And he's saying now it's different. People are coming with a much, in a sense, simpler question. What does Jesus mean for me? And that is something I think we can speak into. I wonder for for you, what does Jesus mean to you? How did Jesus help you when life was difficult? How did Jesus guide you when you felt lost? For those who have struggled with our faith, what is it about him that made us cling on? For those baptized, what is it about Jesus that caused us to take that step? We might not have all the perfect theological or philosophical answers, apologetics, but we can share what Jesus means to me. And lastly, to close, John pointed towards community. This climactic statement of Jesus, John declares, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, not born of natural descent or human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And I think in a sense, there is, uh, this is a two-sided coin of theology. On the one side, we have the sense of God as our Father, God as one who loves us, who promises to forgive us, to invite us to be with Him. And yet, the other side of that coin is we join His family. And indeed, right at the end of John's Gospel, describing Jesus' crucifixion, John speaks of Jesus on the cross, seeing his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby. And he said to them, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. What is Jesus doing? He's pointing people towards community with people who know him. What does it mean to share with people the hope of Jesus in a way that will speak to them? I think on some level it is to share this. I was struck last week uh, during the MAG service hearing from uh, Kaba. Kaba? Yeah, one of the footballers. And it's just amazing to hear him speak about the relationship he's had through the Rock Crusaders to the church in terms of support and food deliveries when they're having a baby and all that kind of thing. 
And just seeing the witness of community, of church community in people's lives and the difference it can make. I think for what it's worth, there's something in that in things like the community cafe. That through our love for one another, we are showing people what it means to be part of God's family. Tim Keller, who I am contractually obliged to uh, quote every week, he writes this. um, We often think of community as simply one more thing we have to follow in the rules of Christian behavior. Okay, I've got to read my Bible, I've got to pray, I've got to stay pure, and I also, as part of that, I need to be part of Christian fellowship. But Keller writes, community is best understood as the way we are to do all that Christ has told us to do in the world. Community is more than just the result of preaching the gospel. It is itself a declaration and expression of the gospel itself. This is what Christ won for you on the cross, a new life together with the people of God. Once you were alienated from God and others, but now you have been brought near to God and to one another through Christ. So I'm going to close in a second. Uh, I'm going to lead us in a short time of prayer. But I just wonder for each of us, as we close, uh, what is it that we might do? What is it that we might want to take from these words from John about what it means to share the hope that we all have in Jesus for ourselves? Is it to try and get a, a clearer sense of Jesus as a person in the midst of the complexity of modern life to refix our gaze upon him? Is it to to return to actually what does it mean for each of us to follow Jesus? We're not just here out of routine, but we're coming because we are captivated by the picture of his son. And what does it mean for us to share something of what we experience in church with those around us? Let's pray. Uh, That's a a lot of words, so why don't we just take a few seconds to to pause and to invite the Lord uh, through his spirit to dwell amongst us and to speak to us. Father, I know that for me, I can often feel like I'm uh, speaking another language when I share something of what I know of you with others. So Lord, I pray for myself, uh, I pray for for our church. We don't want to be people who just gather to have a a lovely time on a Sunday or midweek. But we want to share something of your hope with this community. For people living in what may feel like overwhelming circumstances. For people seeking direction for people looking for something to put their faith in. Lord, for even some of us this morning, can we be feeling something like that for ourselves? We pray, Lord, that you would help us to know that clear, profound hope of the person of your Son. And help us, Lord, to not just share Christian platitudes but to speak about you in a way that cuts to the heart, Lord. To speak not with wisdom or with knowledge, but to speak with the power of your spirit that people's lives might be changed by the reality of your son and who he is for us all. And even just as as we finished, we want to picture the place we might next be going to outside of these walls where we're with people who don't know him. And to say, Lord, Heavenly Father, by your spirit, give me that sense of your leading for what it means to share the hope of your son with this world. In your name, amen.